Good morning. Good morning. On the international lesson, we're into a new month, probably a new season, we might say. It's not officially fall yet, but it's pretty close, and it's Labor Day and all that that's part of it. So uh, that uh, that has us on on a different different level. So we're we're picking up with the uh, fall quarter of our lessons. We're starting out with Abraham, and we're going to talk about Abraham today. Next week we'll talk about his grandson Jacob, and the following week we pick up a little bit more on Jacob, and then we go to Judah. Now Judah's not a person that we're familiar with very well, but uh, he factors into the Bible, and of course Jesus is of the tribe of Judah, and David was of the tribe of Judah, so that's going to factor in. Uh, in our studies, and that'll take us through September. But today we're talking about Abraham, and that's in Genesis uh, that we encounter Abraham, and God promises to uh, him uh, a very special thing. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are kind of uh, a general story of the history of, of the world, the beginnings of it. And we, of course, have the story of Adam and Eve in those early chapters of Genesis, and uh, we get into the uh, Tower of Babel, uh, the diverse languages. We get into uh, uh, the story of uh, Noah and the flood and all of that and the descendants of Noah um, and, and kind of how different people uh, moved about in the world and uh, different uh, occupations and, and things like that, which I guess is a good thing to talk about on the Labor Day weekend uh, because we have the story of how archery uh, began and huntsmen different uh, part of that and those who uh, were working in the crafts uh, as part of their experience. But in uh, chapter 12, we encounter this man named Abram, uh, not Abraham, he's Abram. Uh, the word father in Hebrew uh, comes from A-B or it's pronounced A-V, Av. Uh, so you have Avraham or Avram, uh, that's father. Uh, when it gets changed to uh, Abraham, it's father uh, heightened or, or a father exalted. Um, that's kind of the thing. But it's difficult for Abram or Abraham to believe that he's very exalted because he doesn't have any children. And that's where we encounter him as God comes to him, not in the land of Israel, uh, or as it might have been known then, the land of Canaan. Um, doesn't come to him there. He comes, God comes to Abraham, or Abram, in the Chaldees. That's way up north in what we would call today uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria. That area, the area of the Tigris Euphrates rivers that runs down and out into the Gulf there uh, and, and almost touches into India uh, when you get to it there. It's in Ur of the Chaldees, which is way, way down where the Tigris and Euphrates come together, uh, that uh, Abram hears from God. Now, we don't know how he hears from God. It just says that God told Abram to take his family and all of his stuff, including his father, Terah, uh, and Nahor, and, and all the relatives, and to move up uh, to uh, from Terah. Tehran to Ur of the Chaldees, from the Ur, I'm sorry, to Tehran uh, of the Chaldees. And, and he stops there. Now that's up by the Euphrates River. Uh, I think it's Euphrates, might be the Tigris, but it's by the one river. Uh, and it's up there, and, and he kind of settles down there for a while. Now that's, uh, again, where uh, family members pass away during that interim time that he's there, about 10 years. Uh, and then God speaks to him again and says, I want you to go down. Uh, so he's going to go south from that. He's been going northeast, or northwest from Ur, the Chaldees to Tehran. Uh, and then he goes down south from there into the land of Canaan. Uh, there's a big group of people that he's traveling with. This is not just uh, a a a Abram and Sarah's wife and a couple of servants. We're talking about big herds of, of cattle we're talking about lots of servants. When he gets down there, and there's going to be a time when he's going to have to uh, go into battle to save his nephew Lot. He has a lot of trained warriors. He has an army. 
Uh, this man is not just a small group of people. Unfortunately, he has no children. Uh, we know he has Eliezer, uh, a servant. Now, in the Bible, Eliezer is sometimes spoken of as Eliezer of Damascus. So he may have picked up Eliezer uh, in, in Damascus, which is down to the south, which he would have come through or by. That was one of the travel routes, the merchant routes. Uh, you see, there's a lot of trade that went from up in the Chaldees down through uh, what's known as Canaan out to Egypt, uh, so that they could they could do not. So there was, matter of fact, there was a road, uh, three roads that, that went through there uh, at, at different times. That the tradesmen, the Midianites and the other uh, nomads and the merchants would use to go back and forth. Sometimes there were battles in the land of Canaan. They fought over that land. Uh, so Damascus is a main capital uh, in the part of the northern region there of Syria as they were coming down through. So he may have picked up Eliezer there. Eliezer means Eli is the word my God in Hebrew. And Ezer means help. My God is my help. Uh, Eliezer was indeed a great help to Abram as he was traveling. Now that's the only one that's mentioned directly. But there are other servants and, and his herdsmen and different ones as they're traveling. And of course, they had to keep moving at times because the, the cattle would eat up the grass in one area and they moved to another. So it was that movement kind of idea. Now, did, um, uh, did uh, Abram's father work as a herdsman? We don't have any word on that. But we know that uh, Abram was and Lot was. So uh, Lot's brother, Nahor, uh, Lot's father, Nahor, was a herdsman too at this point. So they're bringing both their herds down from up in Iran and, and coming down into uh, the land of Canaan. And later on that's going to become a problem and Lot's going to have to take one section, but he'll take the valley with his herds because their herdsmen are not getting along and they're big herds. That, that won't come in our lesson, but it's part of the whole story of, of Abram. Anyway, uh, they come down, and uh, uh, and God speaks to uh, Abram again, and changes his name, and and says, "You're going to be Abraham. You're going to be the father of a multitude of people." Uh, that's the, you can look up at the stars and see all that. You're going to be the father of a multitude. Look at the sands. There will be more children of yours than the sands of the sea. And Abraham. Uh, the scripture says, "Believe God." Now you find that in Hebrews as well as in Genesis. Find in, the, in Hebrews the Hall of Fame of the, of the followers of God. Abram is listed first, and and here's the criteria that he's listed. It said he believed God and obeyed Him. He believed God and obeyed Him. So when God said, "Move, Abram," Abram moved. Now, all of our heroes have clay feet, including Abram. Um, there were times when. Uh, he said to God, I don't have any children. Am I to make my servant Eliezer my heir? Now that, that could happen. That had happened at times. And, and Eliezer would bear children, uh, you know, from his descendants in the name of Abram. They would, they would be counted as Abraham's descendants. Uh, there was a program called Leverett Marriage that was a part of the Old Testament. And that was if a man died, his brother was to have children for him, uh, and they would bear the father, the, the brother's name, uh, even though they biologically weren't necessarily brothers. But that was how, in the Old Testament, it was very important to have an heir, uh, and, and not just a daughter for an heir, but a son for an heir. So he's looking at Eliezer as being that, and God says, no, that's not going to be the case. Uh, and then time goes by, and still no children, and now Abram's getting to be close to 100 years of age, uh, Sarah, his wife, is getting up there, and Sarah's looking at the situation, and she's saying, got to have children. Take my handmaid, Hagar, and have children in my name by her. And again, that was done sometimes in Old Testament times, where there wasn't an heir, and uh, you would have that. You get that same situation in uh, the story of, of Jacob uh, with his wives, Leah and Rachel, uh, and he ends up with 12 children because he also has children by their servants. Uh, 
um, because uh, they don't conceive as, as well as, as they hope. And so he has some of those sons by the handmaids or the servants of his wives. And this was the situation here. So we've got that situation to deal with. Uh, and so there is a son born, Ishmael. Uh, but God says, Ishmael is not going to be your heir, Abram. Uh, and, you know, so he doesn't know what's going to happen. He's, he's now near 100, almost 100. Uh, and God says, you're going to have a child. And he does. He has Isaac by Sarah. Uh, Sarah laughs when the angels, the, some angels come to visit them. And Sarah laughs and says, this can't be. Uh, you know, because she overhears the conversation. And uh, her name is changed from Sarai to Sarah, uh, which has something to do with uh, kind of disbelief or laughing or whatever. But she becomes pregnant and she has Isaac. And then there's problems again. Because Ishmael, who's a little bit older, uh, siblings tend to pick on one another and he starts picking on Isaac. And Sarah doesn't want her child picked on. So she says, Abram, get rid of it. Get rid of Hagar, get rid of the whole thing. Even though she was the one that suggested that he have children by Hagar. All right, ends up he has to get rid of them. Now, I say all of this because this guy Abram, who believed God, had some problems along the way too. Um, for one, if you go to Joshua, the last chapter of Joshua, verse 24, uh, I mean chapter 24, verse 1, it says... Joshua is challenging his people. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. Moses has passed on. Joshua's leading them. Uh, and Joshua's a good leader. Uh, he makes some mistakes too, but he's you know, basically a good leader. He says to them, Choose today whom you will serve. The God who brought you out of Egypt and brought you to this land, an abundant land, or choose the gods, gods, not singular, gods, plural, that your fathers served beyond the river. And that river is the Euphrates that he's talking about, beyond the Euphrates River. Now that was Abraham he's talking about. Abraham, who had a, a, a polytheistic, a multitheistic idea of God. We don't think of, of Abraham that way. So he had to be worked or educated, um, developed to the point where he came to the conclusion, there is only one God, and I will serve that God. That didn't happen overnight. And, and his understanding of that God didn't happen overnight. But he came to believe in that God. But he came out of poverty, he came out of pagan culture. To, to learn that. And with that, he brought some of the ideas of that pagan culture. So that when God says to Abraham, you got to take your son Isaac and sacrifice him, Abraham doesn't question that. We would say, Abraham, what are you going to do sacrificing your child to God? Well, he lived in a culture where the firstborn was often sacrificed. Uh, even as you read about the judges and the kings of Israel, you'll find that there's one king who, when he's going to be defeated by the enemy, takes his oldest son and sacrifices him on the city walls. Now, he, he, he's defeated anyway, but you see, he didn't question. So Abraham takes his son and he goes up to Mount Moriah and he's going to sacrifice his son. And you say, he, he wasn't going to do it. Yes, he was. He was going to do it because that was part of the culture. And God revealed to him, no. I'm not going to make you. You take the ram that's in the brambles. Sacrifice that. And out of that experience comes the, the redemption of the firstborn. That was a part of Israel even in the time of Jesus. The redemption of the firstborn. You made a sacrifice because the firstborn belonged to God. Now think of the time in the plagues when Moses was getting ready to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And all these plagues, the the blood in the water, uh, the flies, the gnats, uh, the boils, uh, the hail, all of that stuff. The last one was this, that God's angel would pass over the people. And if there wasn't blood on the doorpost and the lentil, the firstborn, not the others, the firstborn would die. Because the firstborn were the, were the 
in, in, uh, in the New Testament times, the first fruits of the, of the, of the harvest were to be given to God. In other words, he got, he got the first fruits. So that's all part of it. Now, I'm going to go back and quickly run through some things here um, that we don't have time to do, but are important for us to know. When Abraham comes down into Canaan land, there's a famine. He goes down to Egypt. He says to Sarah, you tell them you're my sister. Don't tell them. Now, there's a technical truth to that. Sarah was his half-sister. Uh, wasn't his full sister, but his half-sister. So, uh, he goes down there. But he doesn't tell, have her tell him that just because it's somewhat true. He has her tell her that because Pharaoh will kill me to get you because you're a beautiful woman. Now, you're going to have your sister jeopardized, your wife jeopardized as a sister to save your skin. That's, that's Abraham. That's our man right there. Now, you'd say that happened once. No, it happened twice because after they came back, as Pharaoh said, you, you, you were going to have me do a wrong with your wife. Uh, you have to be. He comes back and he's in back in Canaan land and there's a king there called Elimelech, which means my God the king. Elimelech in Hebrew means my God the king. So uh, he's somewhat related to uh, Abraham being a Semitic person. Abraham says to Sarah, tell him you're my sister. Elimelech, one of his, um, not tribal people, but, but one to whom he's somewhat related, uh, says, I can't believe you would do this to me. You would cause me to sin against the Almighty. You know, so the question is, why? Why did God choose somebody like Abraham, who believes in many gods, when God called him, who sometimes told lies to save his skin, uh, who uh, at, at times, uh, you know, uh, worked a little bit shady deals. Yeah. Well, the thing about this is that the story in the Bible is not about good people. It's about a gracious God. And that's the thing. If you read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, uh, or verse 2, uh, you find there that Paul says to the Ephesians, you were chosen before the foundation of the world to be for his glory. And, and he's not just talking to Ephesians, he's really talking to us too. You and I, we make a lot of mistakes. Our heroes all have clay feet. You know, uh, my hero is Roy Rogers. I loved Roy Rogers as a kid. I, I like Gene Autry and I'm not casting, but I love Roy Rogers. And, and I got to meet him on one occasion. But I, I, in reading, reading in, in his biographies and stuff, yeah, he made some mistakes along the way. Uh, it, it's a word to all of us. That, as Paul says in Ephesians, you weren't saved by works. You were saved by grace, by faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's not of yourselves, it is of God, who created us for good works, but didn't save us by them. Created us for them. Well, that's the story of Abraham. Uh, that's why he's called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when Jesus speaks about him in the New Testament. Because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a gracious, gracious God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day that you've given to us. Thank you for what you have to teach us in the scriptures and for what we can learn and grow in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, see you next week. We'll talk about Jacob.